Hello, my name is John Gabriel. I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. I'm interviewing William D. Inlow. It's August 9th, 2006, and we're at, we're at the Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mr. Inlow, where did you grow up? I was born and raised in Shelbyville, Indiana. What did you do prior to the war? Uh, prior to the war? Yep. Which war? World War, World war II. Okay, I was in school. Okay. Then. During the war. Do you remember where you were for a heart was attacked? Yes, uh, when I heard about it, we were eating Sunday dinner on December the 7th, 1941. You came on the radio? On the radio. I see. How old were you then? Uh, let's see, I did. My birthday is in November, and I was born in 1927, so I would have been 14. Oh, boy, you must have been shocked. Well, kind of the same as 7-11 uh, uh, here in 2001. I understand. So, uh, at age 14, uh, you you had a few years before you were eligible to be drafted? Yes, uh, you had to sign up for the draft at age 18. I see. Which, uh, for me, turned, uh, was uh, November the 1st, 1945. And uh, the war had ended the previous May in Europe and in August. Did you have a draft board right there locally, or did you have to go over there? Uh, the State Shelby board. County Draft Board. I see. Shelby County, Indiana. Could you have enlisted in any branch you wanted? I didn't want to enlist. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I had a chance, perhaps, to uh, avoid being drafted. Hmm. <coughs> but I, after graduating in, from Shelbyville, High, Shelbyville, Indiana High School in 19, uh, May of 1945, uh, two weeks later I entered Indiana University, went to summer school in Bloomington, Indiana, and then uh, attended Indiana the, uh, the fall semester starting in September. So, uh, when when I, my birthday, uh, November the 1st, I was a student at Indiana University in my freshman year, and my counselor at IU, Indiana University, uh, said, uh, if you uh, register for the draft uh, here in Monroe County, we have so many uh, Indiana University students available for uh, the draft, uh, you could uh, probably uh, not ever be drafted. But my dad insisted because he was a, a physician and he uh, worked for the Shelby County uh, Draft Board at, uh, examining recruits free of charge. He insisted that I sign up there and uh, Shelby County was wanted to uh, draft people, they were hard up for recruits to meet their quota. They wanted uh, me to get immediately in the Army before, uh, before Christmas. I, my dad, though, being connected with the grad, he talked them into letting me uh, finish that semester in January, provide, uh, uh, provide that I would go to to the draft, or would accept uh, a sign. I guess there was no such thing as a college deferment back then? There, uh, what? College deferment? No. No. Not, uh, uh, everybody had to go. <laughs> the only deferments were if you were needed for the war effort or uh, other, uh, your brothers or sisters had died. And, that you could get out of service. I see. Did you 
Did you have any other brothers and sisters? I had them? two younger brothers. Did, uh, did they fight in the war? No. My uh, brother, one brother is a surgeon, and, uh, and so he, uh, when he got out of medical school, he had to serve, and then he went to Chile when they had the earthquake down there, and was stationed in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. My youngest, younger brother uh, signed up for the Air Force for, for four years, and he was uh, overseas in uh, Asia. So you, you had to get, you, uh, you had just First semester of college. And, then and one had, summer school. And one summer school. So and I had three fourths of a year. And then you had to get on a train and head off. Is that, is that how it worked? No. Uh, how, did you, how did you head off? It, uh, college, I got home in the last part of January at the end of the semester. And so uh, I was go going with the uh, March the 1st. That month, they, they didn't have time to get me in the January, so I attended, uh, the, went back to the local high school and took typing. And I, uh, during that one, the month of February 1946, and uh, typed almost uh, four hours a day and got, uh, learned how to type, which was very important in what they assigned me to do in the service. So we marched and, in around uh, Okay, I went from Shelbyville, which is 27 miles southeast of Indianapolis. Uh, I was given a Greyhound bus ticket up to Indianapolis by the draft board. Uh, I was at the armory where I had a physical examination. They stripped you completely, they measured you, uh, took off, uh, and you had a test to get your army uh, general classification score, hmm. and uh, then I got sent uh, with this group of draftees that went in on March the 1st from all over uh, central Indiana. Uh, we were taken to Camp Atterbury, which was uh, about uh, 20, 25 miles south of Indianapolis. And we were there for uh, about seven days where we had uh, preparation or kind of some orientation and uh, waiting for assignment somewhere. Then I was sent to Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, state of Washington, for basic training. And then uh, well, tell me about basic training. All right, we had a battalion. I think it was about uh, 800 men. Is that in a battalion? That sounds about right, about, about nine companies. Anyway, uh, they talk about KP. I, only once did I have to be on KP. <laughs> uh, and that time I got to put uh, bags of potatoes in a, say, a, a centrifuge or something. At, that peeled them. But the rest of the time in, uh, in basic training, I don't remember a lot of, but I do remember uh, what my job was. Instead of getting uh, other duties, they put me and two other fellows, uh, Stuart McKeldon from Maryland, and uh, Wally LeBall from Ohio, who had uh, attended Ohio University at Athens. So those two fellows became my friends because uh, we got the job on Sundays. Instead of having to do other kinds of duty guard duty or anything else, the three of us uh, were put by the officers in charge of the office. In the office, we had the files of uh, all about 800 troops. And so we spent Sundays looking through that file, 
wondering why in the world they had put us in charge. And we found out that uh, we had the three highest uh, scores on our uh, Army General Classification Test. Wally LeBall had 143, I had 140, and Stuart had 139. So th these are the only three people. That's why I kind of got out of all uh, guard duty or any other, uh -huh. other duties. Too bad. This is why I think that plus the fact that I had learned how to type, and back then, women typed as secretaries, men didn't learn it, and the army was hard up for typists. Uh -huh. And so the job I was given in the service in, uh, needed some smarts and typing ability. So you didn't have any, uh, you don't have any uh, memories of any particularly tough drill sergeants, do you? No. That's good. Maybe you I, got I've forgotten a lot of things. Well, that's okay. Maybe some of those are not good memories <laughs> for people who do remember them. Well, from Fort Lewis, where did you go? Well, I had uh, a little leave, and then I went to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and uh, to Signal Corps School. What's the Signal Corps? The Signal Corps is uh, in charge of uh, communications in the service. All communications? Right. From the battle lines to the command posts? To All the kinds of communications. I see. Including... Uh, building telephone lines, uh, uh, knowing how to send messages by Morse code and, and, or by radio, and that sort of stuff. I see. But what the school at Fort Monmouth uh, that I went to was learning how to encipher and decipher secret messages. I see. How long were you there? And how, how long was that? Oh, okay. Uh, I was there about, uh, I guess, 13 weeks or so. I'm not sure. Uh, basic training, I think, was about eight weeks. So from um, March, April, uh, sometime in May. And then I was at Fort Monmouth basically from May till uh, September, uh, learning how to encipher and decipher secret messages. Is that, is that training done on specialized equipment? Or, or yes. Uh, I would like to talk to you about that when we get to the Korea part of this. Okay. So it's I'd awesome. like to explain one thing uh, that I wrote down because uh, people don't know the difference between a cipher and a code. You're probably right. I, I and a uh, cipher is spelled C Y P H E R. That's what we use. But it's also spelled C I P H E R. And one thing I got in preparation for this interview was I looked it up in the dictionary. A cipher is a secret writing meant to be understood only by those who have the key to the code. The code. So a code is a more general term than a cipher. Uh, and like just people uh, is a general term, but women is a little bit more specific. And so we're, we use the word cipher, which the public isn't too familiar with. That's a good explanation. So you were you were Fort Mama for approximately 13 weeks. Until from May to September. Was that, was that just the fundamentals of encoding and decoding and ciphering? Uh, learning the job. I see. Did, did you go someplace for more specific or advanced training? After no, that? this was the only place I'm aware of in the United States that this was done. And when, when you... Uh, it when was you, a signal course school for the United States. I see. At Fort Monmouth. What was your rank at this point? I was private for uh, first 10 months. I was in the service, then I became a private first class. I got $50 a month, and it went up to 75 uh, after 10 months. Okay. That's per month. <laughs> That's not much. But of course, say you're paying all your expenses. Sure, sure. Uh, 
Well, in, in the in the training, uh, was it just you and, and, and the rest of your classmates in a, in a room where they... Uh, there weren't very many of us. How many were there? Oh, maybe, uh, I don't remember, 30. That isn't very many. It's very special. Well, life. when I got to Korea, the there were only nine people allowed in our, our, uh, our the room where we had our secret enciphering and deciphering machines. Well, let's go with that. How long from Fort Monmouth uh, were you until you went to Korea? Well, I got a little uh, leave from as I went from New Jersey. I stopped in Indiana for a few days, and then I went to Camp Stoneman, California. Uh, and uh, I was put on a boat, and uh, it took 21 days or 22 days I, uh, to get to Korea. Hmm. Where did you land in Korea? We landed in Korea, but we had stopped first off the coast of uh, Okinawa when a, uh, a small ship came out and brought supplies. Hmm. Then we went to Yokohama. We weren't allowed, we were docked at Yokohama, but we weren't allowed off the ship. We had a, a soldier that needed medical care, and they didn't have a helicopter or way to get him off the ship. Hmm. Uh, and so uh, then we went uh, from Japan over to Incheon, which is on the in, uh, inside side. Or the west side of Korea. I see. What in, when was this? What, what date was this approximately? Uh, it was around, I don't know whether it was the last part of October or the first part of November in 1946. I see. Okay, so you landed at, at, at Incheon. Yes. And uh, what, was your, what was your next destination from that? Seoul, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Uh, the uh, Korea, Incheon didn't have any port facilities, so uh, the boat stayed off offshore and we got in a little, uh, a, a, a boat that, that they had used in the war to uh, go ashore with, with a, a tank or something. Uh, but we had to wait, and they had some boats there in the harbor at Incheon, and when the, the, uh, the tide went down, the boats were in the muck, and, uh, and then when the water or the tide came up, the boats floated again, and we, we had to uh, wait on the boat uh, before we could get there. And then, after we landed the first night, we were put in a house with no heat, <laughs> and it was the coldest place. And we were like a bunch of bumblebees. The guys would be were all together because we we couldn't sleep. It was too cold, and uh, we'd take turns getting on the outside, and the rest of us get on the inside to get warm. <laughs> That's a day I never have forgotten. So your first impression of Korea isn't, isn't so <laughs> terrific. My next impression, we went by uh, train to uh, from Incheon to Seoul, the capital city. Which is about how far? I'm not sure you'd have to. It was several hours. Uh, I felt like I was in the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the rice paddies, there was snow on the ground. Kids running around barefoot and with no clothes like animals. Wow. Uh, people. I don't see how they could live. Korea was so backward. Japan had not spent very much 
money, or it was not very advanced nation. Mm -hmm. We got to Korea uh, to Seoul. If people had any electricity, which most of them didn't, it usually consisted of one bulb in the whole whole house or the the area. Uh, was the city of Seoul in any way modern? No. <laughs> where, where I know the main vehicles were army trucks on the streets. Bicycles were common, though. Yeah. Uh, so where did you land in Seoul? Did they or not land? But where did you where did you finally end up in Seoul? No. The army had taken over uh, a, a grade school, oh. and it was converted into our barracks. We had a wall around the grade school. Uh, and we, uh, anyway, we did not go out in public without at least two of us and having a, each of us having a pistol. Really? Because, uh, in fact, we we just lived in the grade in the grade school practically. It was dangerous. It was dangerous. Uh, a sign said as we landed at Incheon, "Do not drink the water." the alcohol or anything, people go blind or die from it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well then, uh, you were sort of uh, sequestered to the small compound, it sounds like. Yes. How many of you were in the school? In the school? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, it was the headquarters for the 3373rd Signal Service Company. I see. Now, in Seoul at that time, the most modern building and the tallest building was the Banto Hotel, spelled B-A-N-T-O, hotel, seven stories high. Hmm. It was headquarters for the Army in Korea. I, see. I worked in this hotel. Is that where your... Uh, your Cryptographic school or, or, or uh, unit was based. Yes. Oh, I see. In fact, all, this is where all the brass and the, all the, this was the headquarters. This hotel was the headquarters for the whole of Korea, as far as the army was concerned. Okay. Now we also had a civilian government, but uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, only our one room of uh, cryptographic services and another one for the the civilian type government were the only ones in Korea. Hmm. Well, tell us how, tell us what uh, your, your MOS entailed there when you went to Korea. Our, my MOS was 805, which is the cryptographic technician, it's the Army's number. I see. Yes. And, and you, what, was your, what was your first assignment when you got there? Well, uh, the first is, uh, when I got in the hotel, you mean the, where I worked? Sure. Consisted of one room on the first floor with with a guard outside the door, one door. The two windows were uh, painted and had bars over them, hmm. so you couldn't see outside. Uh, there were eight of us that were uh, U.S. Army Signal Corps and one civilian who was in charge. And we, the, uh, the nine people were the only ones allowed in that room. Did you have special security badges or anything? We had to, oh, we had to show, we had badges, but uh, they, the guard, they had 24 hours of guard outside the door because this had all the uh, secret 
uh, secret ways of, uh, of uh, sending in uh, receiving messages. I see. Uh, Who were the messages communicated between? The communication was mostly from Washington, D.C. or uh, Pacific headquarters in Japan. So is it stuff you can talk about or is it classified? Uh, yes. Now, I know some things that I do not dare tell you about. Just working with secrets. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if uh, some of the things I know could cause trouble between South Korea and the United States if they knew what some of the things I know from working with secret uh, secret uh, messages. The first two weeks I was uh, put with the civilian during the daytime. Now we were on duty 24 hours a day in three shifts. The shift ran from eight, uh, 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. That was the day shift. Uh, the day, that day shift uh, consisted of three, uh, three cryptographic technicians and a civilian. The second shift was from uh, 4 to midnight. Three people worked at that shift. Then two people worked from midnight uh, to 8 a.m., seven days a week. Was it a constant flow of messages? Well, uh, no. <laughs> It wasn't a constant flow. Anyway, the first two weeks I was uh, on the day shift, at which time the civilian and the other pros in the day shift uh, wanted to find out if I could do how good I was. And so uh, after two weeks, I uh, worked the night shift from midnight to 8 a.m. So when seven was, days a week. That's rough. Dude. <laughs> when when the messages come in, they're in they're in a code, and I suppose you you would translate them out. Yes. The tell us about the that. code. The code uh, was in three digit or uh, five digits at a time. So you had five five letters of the alphabet. And then more. And the uh, you knew how to decipher the message because the first ten letters, the first two five letter uh, number letters of the alphabet, uh, those ten uh, were repeated as the final uh, ten at the end of the message. This was done so you could check and see if there could, they should be the same. But this is how you knew how to decipher the message. Hmm. Uh, then, then the message, uh, we used what was called Australian bisection. We started the message somewhere in the center of the message when you when it was enciphered. The first you didn't start at the first of the message; you started in the middle, in the middle of a word, and you couldn't it couldn't be between Q and U. <laughs> <laughs> so these messages are coming in, and you're having to. Well, uh, the other people in our company. Signal Corps were radio operators, and they got this through Morse code or teletype or other ways. <coughs> so the message that we received was in code. I see. They pass it on to you. 
Yes. We decode it. Or decide we decipher it. it. Decide it. Yeah. And then from that, the message would have to decide it. Well, then, uh, whoever, well, whoever it was, too, it was uh, given to the generals and the colonels in the hotel there. I see. Is there anything uh, that you could talk about that might be uh, of recognizable interest? Well, I think it's of interest to know. I consider the information about how the coding was done as. Uh, interesting information that probably not too many, I, I feel free to talk about that because as far as I'm concerned, that is historical. Did, did I, I do not want to tell. The only thing I will tell you about the messages received is uh, about the cover-up. Really? <laughs> yes. Uh, a colonel was running around with his uh, girlfriend and the two of them got killed when the jeep turned over oh. and orders came from the United States because this guy was well known and I think he'd gone to West Point and he oh. and the headquarters said delete everything, don't ever let your wife know <laughs> <laughs> okay that's funny huh? yeah well was there anything on the political front that you were reading coming back and forth between Washington and Japan about the Russians maybe up north or anything like that? There were all kinds of secret messages that I will not tell you any about. I don't want to get indicted. I don't want to get the United States in trouble. Got it. Well, we don't want you to But I will tell you about uh, what I did. Okay. I mean, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how how, because I think that uh, uh, enciphering and deciphering of secret messages now has gone so far, this, because this was 59 to 60 years ago, that uh, it would be of interest historically to know a little bit about how messages were Absolutely. sent. Uh, we used Greenwich, England time. Our clocks, we had a clock that was set within uh, that time. So all messages in the United States were sent on the basic uh, system of, of uh, uh, the day started Greenwich, England time. Uh, we had what was called SIG cum machines spelled S-I-G-C-U-M. These were machines that uh, were oh, about that long and uh, maybe about this wide and they uh, had a keyboard in front and then they had uh, two banks Starting from the right side, there was a rod with a handle on it, and in the banks we put uh, rotors. By rotors, I mean they were uh, around about uh, eight inches in diameter, like a wheel made of black bakelite. They had uh, about 27, 28 the, for the uh, 26 letters of the alphabet, uh, and I guess a, so maybe a space for something, or uh, I think there was just one space for a blank space. So there were about 27. I'm not sure that this is the exact number. Anyway, uh, they had copper. Uh, little copper circles uh, around the black circle part which represented each of the letters of the alphabet. It, 
in the bank, inside the bank, were little ball bearing sort of things, copper. So that when, uh, well, in the rotors, uh, they were wired like R. If I type on my keyboard R, then that message started with the, uh, the line, the electrical line that went to the R. And that R was, was uh, wired up to maybe uh, M on the other side of the rotor. So the R I typed on the typewriter as I was in ciphering or deciphering changed, which was uh, changed from an R to an M. Then it went to the next rotor uh, where it, 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 an M was wired up with maybe uh, Z and then to the next rotor where the Z was changed to another letter. Wow. In the bank were five, we had two five uh, banks of five uh, where rotors, you put the rotors in, there are five of them in a row, here's your keyboard, here's the uh, first bank, and here's the second bank. So when you typed on your subcom uh, sub machine, like I said in R, they had an M, then it went through the five banks on front, and then the five banks, so that that letter had been changed ten times before it became what it was really supposed to be. Wow. Can you picture this? How <laughs> uh, many you kept everything straight? <laughs> I guess we'll see that for you. <laughs> the, the rotors were changed every day, depending on what, it, what day it is. So it's important for you to know what day this message had been sent. We had several machines and we'd set it up for that day. This is Greenwich time, not ours. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anyway, some of the rotors, the rotors could go in forwards or backwards. In other words, on the top of the, uh, if it were a wheel, it would be on the tire or the tread. You could see the uh, letters of the alphabet. And when you put it in frontwards, the letters, you could read them as you were here, but if it came in backwards, they were upside down. Uh, the rotors, we got a change of rotors once a month. A man came to us, I forgot, they let him in. <laughs> and also the people who worked on the machine, so I did, forgot, they got in the room besides. We had, anyway, uh, he had uh, handcuffed to him new rotors. So we changed, and he took the old ones with him. Uh, we had we had a sort of a little closet. It was about six feet high, about six feet wide, about six feet deep. This was like a safe. We had drills at least once a month, a week, I mean, where we took all of our about eight machines and put them in there, and all of our messages, and, and kind of like fire drills. This, uh, if we were attacked, we were to, regardless of what we were to, doing, we had to uh, put these. Uh, machines and all the papers that we had and everything in there and uh, it was fixed for uh, combustion of 
every everything secret uh, so that it would be melted to keep anybody from ever getting a hold of it. Wow. Um, did, did anything like that ever, were you ever afraid of anything like that happening? Well, we were only about 30 miles south of the uh, 38th parallel, so it wouldn't have, uh, a half hour or so, or an hour, somebody could come over. So we, we were aware of this danger at all times. But you were never in any danger. I don't see well, nothing happened. But we sure had these drills. <laughs> Good. Uh, Can I ask if you were involved in any code breaking? No. Was that, was that done over there at all that you know of? Not that I know of. Now, during the daytime, the uh, 8 to 4 shift, uh, of course, the, all the head, Army headquarters, they were sending out messages to Washington, D.C. or Japan and contact. And so uh, during the daytime, they were encoding and, I mean, in ciphering and deciphering messages. That crew, or that. And then, uh, most of it, though, most of the, the uh, 12, uh, the 4 o'clock to midnight shift uh, did, uh, well, a lot of the work that the messages they want to send were done that are typed up during the day, and so, Actually, most of the enciphering was done between the four and midnight shift. Now, I was one of two people working the uh, midnight to 8 a.m. shift. I do not remember, after the first two weeks, I do not remember enciphering new messages. Almost all the work from 12 midnight to 8 a.m. was messages from Washington, D.C. because it was daytime over there and nighttime where I was. And so these messages, the, the message center worked 24 hours a day. And so after the first two weeks, I was deciphering these messages almost entirely. And after you got the message, it was a five, five letter things, and you started typing that. Then, right in front of you, there was a little tape that moved, and uh, the message changed to English was on this tape. The tape uh, had, was glued on the back of it, and as, well, okay, as you typed it, uh, uh, as you typed a letter, these rotors started spinning one at a time. And, and, and so you typed a letter and then it, the, the, the noise as they spun came here. Because they spun, changed, changing the letter up, uh, up to upright. And they, uh, you typed a letter and, and they spun and made this sound. But of course when you're typing kind of fast, but anyway, the end result came out on this tape. And so when the message was over, you had a long tape. Uh, the tape was about that wide. And, uh, and you put it in a little thing with a sponge and uh, some water. And uh, you had to find the start of the message. And you... Uh, started the, uh, you, you, you put the message in English and now there were no spaces between words. Uh -huh. And, uh, uh, but you, you put, you put, uh, tape it to a sheet of paper, this tape stuck to the paper. Uh, 
then after uh, after you had the message taped up, then you had to go to a typewriter and type this up to give to the uh, for the next morning, 8 a.m. I was off duty, uh, but you had to have all these messages ready to give to the generals and colonels and uh, people in the building, typed up in English, and uh, I mean, in, so that they can read it. <laughs> yeah. So that was the other half of the job besides deciphering. deciphering. Do, you, do you think, it, do you know of uh, any instances where somebody else intercepted our, our messages to your, to your unit? I don't know of any thing of that sort. Nobody, you, you've never heard of that? No, that, isn't, that wasn't my job. Is there anything else about your, uh, about your, your job that you'd like to uh, bring up at this point? Uh, any, any memorable experience? Uh, while you well, were yes. Uh, we didn't have to work too hard on Saturday and Sunday because uh, in Washington, D.C., the, they weren't working. <laughs> and so we got to sleep a little bit in the middle of the night. One of us had to stay awake, but uh, another memorable was uh, New, New Year's Eve. Yeah. My buddy got drunk <laughs> and, uh, on New Year's Eve, and I was there alone. <laughs> well, if he couldn't drink the water and the alcohol, he must have brought his own. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, you could, the stuff you got from the PX, the water and uh -huh. things, but... You, did, you didn't take any chances. Well, what did you do in your, in your, in your spare time? Well, uh, I was brought from the Bondo Hotel back at 8 o'clock. There were uh, other Signal Corps people in our corps that worked, they worked the same hours. So there were, the, we were at the night shift and we came back to the the grade school that was our barracks, and we had breakfast. Mm -hmm. Then I went to sleep, and so I slept roughly from about nine o'clock until four or five o'clock in the evening. I see. Uh, then I got up for supper, and then after supper, uh, we played cards. But the main thing I did. We had a, a, a basketball court, uh -huh. and it was over in Korea that I became an excellent basketball player because we uh, played basketball uh, five, six hours a day. Wow. Get, uh, our company got so good that, uh, well, we had a man named Johnny Furlong from Los Angeles who was about 6'6", and then our company clerk uh, had played basketball for Purdue University, and uh, our company commander was interested in basketball, and we played so much basketball, and I was uh, about sixth or seventh man on the team, I wasn't one of the starters. We had a memorable game with the Korean national uh, team. Uh, there weren't stands, but you can stand around. We played uh, the Korean team, and there were only men there. No women at all. And they stood around the court. The Koreans were such much smaller than we were. They passed the ball so fast, they were fast, they were very, they played together, but they didn't have, they at that time hadn't learned to shoot with one hand. Huh. And they were amazed how we, because every shot, every pass was two-handed. Boy, they were good for long shots, but we were too big, and uh, anyway, we ended up, 
winning the All Korea basketball tournament. And if I had not been sent home, I would have gotten to uh, go to with the team to the Philippines for the All Pacific Co uh, tournament in the armed forces. Uh, Another thing of interest was while the grade school had USA style toilets, the Bonto Hotel, which was made really for international tra uh, people back then, didn't have toilets. They had slits and in the wall in the floor and uh, with a kind of a cup at one end. Uh, and so to go to the toilet at work, um, you, uh, you had to, if you had a bowel movement, you had a, a stoop. <laughs> and the thing that r really bothered me was they hired these uh, Korean girls so cheap that this girl was in the toilet all the time, <laughs> a hundred uh, every hour whenever you went, <laughs> and it was difficult for me <laughs> to get used to a woman yeah. <laughs> in the bathroom. <laughs> also, I had uh, my hair cut at the barber shop. And uh, this, uh, that, this was done by a Korean girl getting her hair cut. And uh, that was very embarrassing also. Uh, uh, how, 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 how long were you on, on the Korean Peninsula? From the late October, or early November, until sometime in February. When I was drafted, there were 66 of us in Indianapolis. The recruiters tried to recruit people for uh, 18 months. They said, if you sign up with us, you'll be in the service 18 months, and then you can get out. If you don't sign up, who knows how long you're going to be there. Thirteen of us didn't sign up, and I was what? Out of the 66. Uh, Tom Schwartz, who was on Kokomo, Indiana, uh, as a junior in high school, runner-up basketball team in the state basketball tournament, was uh, one of the 13. He was drafted at the same time I was. He later was the center at Indiana University playing for that. Uh, what are we doing with time? About 10 or minutes. Uh, let's see, what were we talking about? Well, I was, I was going toward where, uh, when you actually left Korea. Oh, okay. In your last days All right. Uh, they, they had a ruling. Uh, in about February, January or February of 47, that they were going to try to go with an all re, uh, recruit army. Mm -hmm. I think it was in January of 47, and that they would release uh, draftees. And uh, they said for uh, money saving reasons, the ones they would let go first would be those that were going to use their GI Bill and were uh, in college. And so uh, I applied and uh, I applied and got out early. I came back to uh, San Francisco Bay uh, after 21 or 22 days at sea, 
the first thing I saw, it was so cloudy, I was amazed that the navigation was good enough. I looked up and all of a sudden the, the, the bridge, I don't know where it's a golden gate or what bridge, you saw the center of the bridge, you couldn't see either end or land. It was the first part of the United States I came back to. Uh, I went to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where I was discharged. I uh, entered, okay, that year they had, in 46, 47, they had so many GIs uh, going to uh, school that they delight, they the start of the semester till October and ran till February instead of September to January like it usually was. Does that mean you're through? I think we just have a few more minutes. Five, five minutes. Oh. Uh, so I went and started school. I got enrolled the last day you could enroll, and so I hadn't seen my parents or anything, but I went in immediately and enrolled at Indiana University and had about two weeks of schooling to catch up with. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started school immediately afterwards. I was officially discharged on uh, March the 20th, but I did have some uh, leave time, so I, I actually got entered in school around uh, was fifth, fourth, fifth of March, I think. And your career after the after the war, after you graduated college, uh, what was your career? I went into the construction business. I uh, I've got a master's in teaching. I taught high school. I uh, worked for the Indiana State Highway Commission as a real estate broker and appraiser. I uh, appraised the land uh, in Dearborn County, Indiana, uh, where the I-275 bridge uh, crosses the Indiana, where the, as an appraiser, uh, for six years I was an appraiser for uh, the State Highway Commission. My wife died in 1966, uh, and so I quit then. Another interesting thing could be uh, what it was like on the boat. Okay. Uh, on the troop ship that I went overseas on, they had pipes uh, the size of a bed with uh, canvas in the center and ropes around the thing, edge and they were stacked six high and they were on a hinge, on two poles, a hinge and the post went up. I mean you could fold the beds up at night and so uh, the people on the troop ship were six, high. I mean, you only had, you turned over, you, uh, the fellow above you was uh, only about, well, if you got your hands up in the air too far, you were touching his, the bottom of his canvas. Uh, when we got, uh, when we went overseas the first time, uh, we immediately hit a storm. The, all of us got seasick, almost, in the, the latrines. We had combat boots that came up to about here. Uh, uh, were full of vomit. Uh, so we were st uh, going around in it. The guys that stayed in bed <laughs> going overseas never did get well. Um, we're, we're down to our last minute. Okay. And, uh, it sounds like you had a, a terrific career, a valuable career in the military. And, well, know, I, I think it was unusual. You were, are not going to have too many people that you've interviewed that will have had the 
experience that I had. Without question. Without question. Yours was it's probably point. more interesting for you than most. Well, it could be. But uh, regardless, I think whoever views this tape will find it interesting. And I, I thank you for your service and for conducting the interview. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.